we award in the amount of $100,000. And we make the application available and eligible to community organizations, hospitals, universities and schools, as well as research programs. And we welcome all members of those specific communities to apply. The institution must have public charity status or not-for-profit status under IRS Code Section 501c3 or have a charitable designation number if it is in Canada. And we ask that programs target education and or care of women specifically. Great. So we'll give you a little bit of background on the 2015 Heart to Heart Grant. Um, so it, Nominated by the Alpha Phi chapter at Penn State, Geisinger Health Systems Heart and Vascular Institute was awarded with our $100,000 grant. Um, the Foundation Board of Directors and Medical Readers were thoroughly impressed with their proposal for a comprehensive women's heart health project. Um, they've set out to bridge the gap between genetic determinants and preventable lifestyle factors linked to heart disease in women. And they've embarked on that mission thanks to Alpha Phi or thanks to Alpha Phi Foundation and its funding through the Heart to Heart Grant. And for this reason, we have Dr. Skelding with us this evening to talk to us more about the Women's um, Heart Health Project. Um, Dr. Skelding is a nationally recognized interventional cardiologist at Geisinger. She is the front pioneer of the work of, women's heart health, of the Women's Heart Health Project. And she is our very own Alpha Phi sister from the Zeta Sigma chapter at Franklin and Marshall. I will pass the presentation over to uh, Dr. Skelding now at this point. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Dr. Skelding, we can hear you. Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, wonderful. Um, I don't know who's on and, and what um, group I have with me, but welcome to all of you. Um, it has been really a wonderful honor to be given um, the designation of this year's Heart Award grant. Uh, I had the pleasure of, of being at Franklin and Marshall for their Heart Health Month um, event um, about two weeks ago, and we got to talk about this at that time as well. And it was just a wonderful um, event and opportunity to um, see the growth of my own sorority uh, at Franklin and Marshall. This project and this program is really multifactorial <laughs> and wouldn't be possible without having partners. Um, and so some of my partners are on this very first slide, um, one in maternal fetal medicine, one um, who helps me with the um, rollout of the genomics initiative, and then, of course, um, um, the program managers as well. Um, it won't let me change the slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the scope of the problem. Of course, cardiovascular disease is very important, and it certainly is um, the leading cause of death in women over 50. Um, more women die from this disease than all types of cancers combined. And in 2015, over 600,000 U.S. women had pregnancy-related complications. And those were, the, those were ones that were noted and reported. Um, many women don't have great access to health care during their pregnancy. And so places like free clinics um, and uh, charitable care might not be noted in these numbers, of course. At Geisinger, the number, as we're trying to sort of hone down on it, um, is, a, is a moving target. And we are seeing about 30% of the women who come into the Geisinger system with a pregnancy is having a pregnancy-related complication. So the number is really quite high. And although the women predominantly are <laughs> younger having um, their, pre their pregnancy, um, this risk begins at one year, and the risk continues to have an impact on their life for over 30 years. What's amazing to me is back in 2010, uh, the NHLBI recommended that there be studies and trials done 
to look specifically at this problem and to follow patients long term to assess the outcomes and progression of disease. And to date, the largest studies that have been done in this manner have really been done outside of the U.S. And one of the biggest studies is a study in Finland, which was able to um, capture all of the data from their women starting in the late 1950s and, and did validate that this problem is really an international problem. These are some of the diagnoses that have associations with pregnant with um, cardiovascular disease later in life. Preeclampsia is the one that is most reported and most um, collaborated in the numbers, and that's probably because it's such a very um, high-risk uh, problem for the women during their pregnancy and delivery time. Um, but even low levels of high blood pressure in pregnancy cause an increased risk of somewhere between two and five times the risk of the general population. Those women who have drops in their blood counts as their pregnancy progresses are at risk, as well as women who have premature babies. Um, those that have placental problems, and that can be a bleeding problem, a rupture, a placenta previa, which means it's a misplaced placenta, all of those women are at risk, as well as women who have infants that are small for their birth age. It means that they are smaller in either stature or smaller in weight. Those women with diabetes while pregnant also have a, ri a risk with cardiovascular disease later in life, and the risk is certainly higher if the women require insulin during their pregnancy. And another group of women are those who have miscarriages or stillbirth, and those women are hard to capture because many of them um, miscarry even before presenting to a uh, high-risk uh, obstetrical clinic. What's interesting is that um, any one of these alone can increase the risk two or three times, but when there are two of these or three of these, the risk can go up to 10 times um, the risk of the general population, so it really is a huge public health issue. And truly, the general knowledge in the medical community is really lacking. Um, OBGYN um, is a group that is more likely to collect the data because it's what they deal with. So they're asking the questions every day about women's pregnancies and um, their risk factors, but they're not likely to feel that they're either trained or, um, or, or have the um, ability to treat these risk factors long term. Now, the internal medicine population, when they were querying, were more likely to test the risk factors when they're told the correlation. But in general, they don't ask questions about pregnancy-related complications in their history and physicals when a patient presents to the clinic. And really, that we're saying that only about 5% of internal medicine doctors will actually take a woman's pregnancy history in their initial visit with the women. Um, because as we know often the women are seen by OBGYN younger in life, and then as they leave their childbearing years, move on to an internal medicine doctor, and that isn't the top of their priority list of, of questions to be asking at the time, unfortunately. Now, I did a survey. There's a physician's mother's group, which is on uh, social media, and there's 50,000 women in the group. And I sent a survey to them, and I asked did, if you had a pregnancy-related complication, did anyone talk with you about it? And then the second question I asked is, if you are an internist or family medicine provider or an OBGYN, did you know about this risk? And number two, where were you told? Did you learn on your own, or were you taught in your training? And it was really unbelievable that only 9% of women physicians with pregnancy-related complications even knew about their risk. And many of the women queries who are treating these women uh, were either completely unaware or were only aware of certain correlations and not the complete picture.
So why, um, why is this happening? Is there a genetic association? Well, that's one of the things that we're looking into. And the other question is, which came first? Does finding the complication give us an early clue that there's going to be a problem later in life? Or does the pregnancy-related complication have an effect on the woman that has a long-standing risk? Well, interestingly enough, often the women have no other risk factors or vascular disease, suggesting that it's an early clue. Therefore, this, we think of it as sort of a failed stress test. So it's not that the pregnancy-related complication is causing the problem, but more so that it is unmasking um, a lifelong uh, history for cardiovascular disease risk. And then the next question is, is what can we do? Well, the American Heart Association in 2011 presented some guidelines for the first time saying that we should really systematically look at this problem. But um, the problem is, is we don't necessarily know exactly what to do to change the course of, of women's risk other than to tell them to try to prevent having risk factors by exercising, having a healthy diet, and living a healthy lifestyle, including not smoking and watching your risk factors um, that are you know, the traditional risk factors like high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Um, so what the recommendations are, again, is for diet and lifestyle modification, as well as early evaluation after delivery by a cardiologist or a family um, primary care provider. And one of the large studies, which is done again outside of the US, predominantly suggests that making major lifestyle changes in women early in life to decrease their risk factors can lead to an 80% lower mortality from heart disease later in life. What are the problems? The problems are that the care is fragmented, that women get their care early by OBGYN and then later by the internist. Um, certainly, there is a knowledge deficit in healthcare professionals and in patients, insufficient research to look into the mechanisms, and lack of healthcare system's ability to follow patients longitudinally. Often, records in the past have been paper and then systematically destroyed at a 10-year time frame. And there are no risk factor calculators. So it's not like you can go online and you can calculate the risk and plan based on that because we just don't have them. We don't have enough data. The recommendations are to treat a woman with a, cardio, with a pregnancy related complication as if she were a 60 year old woman in regard to risk factor modification. And that's such a nebulous recommendation. We should be certainly doing better. This is a, just a little bit of an outline of what we've done to, up to this point. Um, in 2005, we developed the program initially and developed a clinical database and started collecting genetic samples. We did risk factors for women all, in, all over the community. Geisinger has a large footprint and treats patients all over Pennsylvania as well as New Jersey and into New York. We do risk screenings on the road where we provide these risk screenings free and comprehensive to women. and we go out and spread the word. So we go out and we speak to church, church groups, university lecture halls, AAUW, community Red Hat societies, anybody who will have us and we can get a, a captive audience to talk about these issues. We've also done a lot of work nationally with presentations and publications, some out of our own data, of course. So in 2006, we got a small initial grant to start developing the program. And then in 2012, we received a second grant to try to do some further integration in the electronic health record. And then, of course, at this point, the Alpha Phi grant has really moved us into a new um, direction and has helped us tremendously to develop the program. These are some of the pieces that the funds from the Alpha Phi Foundation will help us carry out. One is that we will certainly have a lot of educational materials and events for patients. We have chosen to focus on obesity because it is now the leading cause of cardiovascular, for cardiovascular death and has surpassed smoking as a risk factor. This is also one of the areas that 
notoriously has been an underfunded um, care piece for patients as their insurance often has a very limited benefit in this area. We are providing cooking classes with proven heart prevention reverse and reversal dietary tools, providing women exercise guidance, developing support groups uh, with our partners in the behavioral health group to help change behaviors and develop new habits. Also doing a lot on social media, webinars such as the one today, and teaching folks like you are listening today so that you can go on and spread the word to other people about the risk. There are educational materials for providers being developed, which includes DME, uh, which is continual medical education, which is something that healthcare providers need to keep up to date on a, on a yearly basis, as well as some of the pieces that we're also providing for the community. Our partnership with the Alpha C Foundation has been longstanding already, but uh, this is one of the earlier pieces with the webinar. We've also done um, some information in the journal, as well as, again, getting the word out to um, groups and chapters so that they can go on and teach other folks. The genomic research is a partnership with our group, which is called MyCode. And we have embedded consenters that will consent women and help them um, to get their uh, genetic data developed and to identify markers that might help us predict who might have cardiovascular disease later in life. So we're looking at a couple of groups. One cohort is a retrospective group, which is a group of women that have cardiovascular disease um, and have had a pregnancy-related complication. And we're also taking young women who are having pregnancy-related complication and getting them involved in the cohort so that we can follow them long term and identify the groups that do and do not develop cardiovascular disease. It's very important to sort of attack this at two, two different um, directions so that we can enrich the cohort and gather the data in a timely basis. And we have a really um, unique population in central Pennsylvania where many folks have uh, either themselves or have family members who have been uh, in the area for generations. And then we're able to get the mother, the grandmother, the daughter, the aunt, um, and have a really a full um, group of women that we can tied together genetically. We're, right now, we're, we're trying to um, put together a multidisciplinary clinic, an actual place. Um, our multidisciplinary clinic now is, um, if you will, a virtual clinic. We have a collaboration with maternal fetal medicine, and we both see the patients and work on the patients together, but we don't have a home. Um, we do believe that having a physical structure in the future will help us to more centralize our care, although we are making sure that we get every piece handled on every patient every time. The pre-delivery clinic we see is obviously providing standard high-risk care, but also providing psychological support, dietary guidance, and education. And one of the things that we are going to focus on as well is encouraging breastfeeding because it has been found in studies to help attenuate the risk, up to a 72% risk decrease. And the longer that women breastfeed, the better. The post-delivery clinic will be more focused on the cardiovascular end, which having, again, education, a formal evaluation of traditional risk factors, um, evaluating endothelial dysfunction, uh, which can be done with non-invasive testing, and making recommendations for lifestyle modification that both the patient and their family can carry out. We really do believe that focusing on uh, the women um, will help them to take home some healthy ideas and lifestyle choices to their families. So what we can do certainly is affect the outcomes of the women as well as their families with lifestyle modification by providing the tools to make and maintain this change. All this done on the background of also collecting data, 
collecting their genetic samples and trying to identify further ways in the future of being able to treat these women. This is sort of an interesting slide, and I'll go through it with you. If there is a 50-year-old woman with prior pregnancy-related complications, and she has more than two risk factors when she reaches the age of 50, she has a 50% risk for cardiovascular events. However, a 50-year-old woman with only one risk factor has only an 8% risk of cardiovascular events. So by helping women to reduce their risk, even from two risk factors down to one risk factor, we can essentially impact a 42% absolute risk reduction, which we think is really important to embark on. And I think getting to women early right after their pregnancy when they become, initially are identified as a woman at risk is the time frame to do it. Um, I really, again, appreciate the opportunity to share the work that we're doing, uh, both service-oriented as well as scientific. And I think it's very important to provide such um, uh, comprehensive evaluations and treatment for women in order to um, stop <laughs> having to report yearly the statistics on women and at some point um, having uh, the risk be equivocal between the sexes. So thank you for your attention and, and I'm happy to answer any further questions. Great. So everyone on the line um, who would like to ask a question, if you utilize the star six um, function, you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask the question. If you're connecting through the internet, um, with audio through the internet, you can use the mute or unmute button on the join me um, and ask your question directly to Dr. Skelding. Well, I have a question. It's Susan. Um, so what are some practical things that we can do in our own networks, if you will, Dr. Skelling, to further your good work in a practical fashion? So as an example, should I be asking all my friends to sort of jot down what their pregnancy history was and offer that during their next physical exam so that it's documented, or what are some practical things we could do? Well, I think that that's a great suggestion. I think, number one, just opening the communication with the patients and the providers, realizing that sometimes the providers are going to be unaware of the data, but it may certainly help to um, jog their interest and help them go out and try to learn on their own, and, and um, hopefully um, there'll be programs in the future that will continue to um, improve um, the uh, knowledge and the awareness of this problem. The second thing I think that we can do is to encourage uh, women to get active together. I think it's very um, hard sometimes to um, change a lifestyle, an exercise pattern, a healthy eating pattern on your own. So I always think it's great when we have a screening event at night, and a group of women come there for their girls' night out. Um, and they're looking to, to try to um, help each other be healthy and change lifestyles so that they all sort of grow old gracefully together. And I think so two, two important things. One is making sure that your healthcare provider is aware of your risk. And number two, um, try to um, engage in healthy activities and encourage other women around you to do the same to help lower your risk overall. Great. Great advice. That is very good advice. You mentioned um, a bit about um, practitioners not really having some of the knowledge around this issue. How do you really see the Women's Heart Health Project advancing sort of the research area so that more physicians are familiar with the um, risk factors of, you know, a pregnancy complication and what that means for your heart health down the line? Well, two ways. One is, um, you know, our system is a very large system. So we have 
you know, well over a thousand providers that are um, connected to Geisinger. So we really have an ability to um, get this information to all the providers um, that are going to go off and um, um, share this knowledge or hopefully treat their patients better based on this knowledge. So that's one piece. The other piece is, is to publish data. And so gathering the information and getting the information out um, in peer review journals is a really uh, vital thing. Um, because, you know, um, people really look toward the journals to get um, their education and, and if they hear something, they often go to the internet, go to the library, pull up journal articles to see if what they're being told or what they're thinking about is validated. So I think that's really important. And that's why we're looking at both um, a retrospective cohort and a prospective cohort. Because looking at a retrospective cohort will help us you know, gather some data initially to get some early publications. Um, but um, having the ability to follow people prospectively is really the gold standard for these genetic studies. Mm -hmm. oh. So sort of along those same lines, one of your earlier slides talked about some, all the great educational materials and collateral that you are developing. With the advent of technology and um, geographic diverse conferences and some of the journals that you just spoke about. Can we can we hope that your good work is going to organically start finding its way to the Midwest and other parts of the Northeast and even to the West Coast as people pick up on all this work that you're doing and start to share some of these materials? And I think there are. Um, there is a group of, of both male and female providers who are out there um, already doing this every day. It's just that it's not um, as many as you'd like. And, and part of it is, is that we're early in the process. So what do I mean by that? I mean that um, the association has been identified, and now we have to identify, we, now we have to know what to do with it. So um, I think that inherently people get frustrated when they're told there's a problem, but there's nothing they can do to change that. Um, and so at this point, you know, we know that pregnancy-related complications unmask a risk. And when women have these complications, um, we know that they have a very high risk of having an event later. And so the question is, how do we change that? And so we're recommending diet and exercise and decreasing the risk factors. Um, but it would be lovely <laughs> to have something very concrete, you know, um, find something genetically to modify with a pill or with a shot or with some genetic therapy um, because that's what people um, feel more comfortable with. Um, the same thing with things like cholesterol. Um, and the correlation with heart disease. So years ago, people knew that high cholesterol caused heart disease, but they didn't know what to do about it or if they could do anything about it. It wasn't until we identified medications and, and tools, dietary tools, that could change um, people's cholesterol profile and lower their risk for heart disease that it really, really took traction um, because it's very difficult. Um, one of the most difficult things, I think, is to change people's eating habits and their exercise habits. Um, even though we talk about this every day in every clinic with every patient, um, it is one of the most challenging um, things for both providers and patients to under, undergo um, because it's... Uh, I mean, if it was easy, we wouldn't have the obesity problem that we have. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's something that is day after day, um, all day long, every day for the rest of your life, and, and those changes are really hard to, to impact. Um, certainly when people do them and they carry on, they, they make a huge difference. Um, what I generally tell folks is try to do it for 21 days. 
because um, we know that from a lot of behavioral health studies, if you do something every day for 21 days straight, it is um, likely to become a habit, um, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and so if we can get people to commit to at least try for 21 days, often um, they will at least um, carry on for some time. And people certainly will fall off the wagon of eating healthy and exercising, but a little bit easier to get back on board when they know they've done it once before. So this may sound like sort of a sophomore question, but what do you remember the event or the discussion that caused you to want to pursue this particular line of research? Well, a couple of things. One is just seeing year after year um, the epidemiologic data that women are dying of heart disease at a much greater pace than women than men. I'm sorry, and seeing that being reported year after year after year. And the American Heart Association has done a wonderful job at getting awareness out. But still today, in 2016, the awareness is only two-thirds. In other words, only two-thirds, and that's just in the Caucasian population. It is much lower in the African American population and the Hispanic populations of women. But in the United States, only two-thirds of Caucasian women are aware that heart disease is their largest risk for, for death. Um, and that's sad. You know, the American Heart Association has had the Red Dress campaign for ages and, and has been really out there um, uh, spreading the word um, extensively. So that's one thing. The other thing is just very practically, um, being a, an interventional cardiologist, and looking at, which is, I implant stents um, and do balloon procedures on people that have blockages in their heart. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that keeps me up at night is that I also take care of patients who are having a heart attack. And so um, any time of the day or night, myself or one of my partners, if you have a heart attack, we come in and we um, try to stop that heart attack. Um, and there is an initiative. Um, with the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, which is trying to get people to treatment quicker. Um, so just from the time of onset to the time of treatment, making that time as short as we can. Because we know when we do that, the damage to the heart is less. And in looking at it from that standpoint, we find that women don't get health care um, as early as men do. So they don't identify that they have a problem and call someone for help. They also um, don't, when they come to the emergency department, um, have the same um, expedited care as men do. So it's often a longer time from the time they walk in the emergency room to the time that they're identified as having a heart problem and get to the right people and get treated. So their time from the beginning of their heart attack to the time that their heart attack is stopped and their treatment begins um, is much longer than men. And, and I see that practically. So I see women come into the emergency room after being home for 12 hours thinking they had indigestion, or coming into the emergency department and being treated for indigestion and not recognizing the fact that they've had a heart attack. So it really is all steps along the way. And yeah. um, very frustrating to be treating some, it's very hard to treat someone late in the game as well. There's more technical challenges in, in treating them. And so just seeing it day after day and saying, what, we've got to fix this. Why is this happening? Um, and part of it is, again, knowledge of patients to know this might be a heart attack, I need to call someone, to the knowledge of the providers, wait. Maybe, maybe this woman's having a heart attack. Maybe it's not indigestion. Let's call somebody who can treat this. Um, so it's really a long continuum. Um, and then identifying the fact that men and women truly respond differently to medications, to procedures, to devices, and um, just really um, being frustrated that there's not enough data out there to tell us why. 
there are probably things that we're doing for women that are more helpful than they are for men. And there are probably things we're doing for women that are really not as helpful for them. Um, it's really not one size fits all. And today, um, the predominant um, level of care is that someone comes in um, having a heart attack or um, having a cardiovascular event of any kind, um, that they're treated very similarly. And there are likely important differences um, that should tailor the care a little bit better than we're doing. And to think that happens every day. Every day. Every day. Yes, every wow. day. Um, well, I just want to ask you a little bit about what your experience has been like as the 2015 Heart to Heart Grant recipient, um, working with the foundation and also getting a bit of a chance to connect with some of our chapters. I know you recently spoke at the Zeta Sigma Red Dress Gala, um, and then you were also nominated. This project was nominated by the Gamma Rho chapter at Penn State. Um, if you could speak a little bit about what working with the chapters has been like this year. Well, we've, we've had a, a prolonged involvement um, with the chapter at Penn State, um, and it has been sort of um, inspiring to me each time to talk to these women um, because they're very engaged, and they very much <clears throat> want to go out and help. Um, and so um, often, you know, I do lots and lots of talks every year, and um, you know, sometimes you talk to people and then, and then the, you know, people just sort of walk out the room at the end. Um, but here are these, you know, young girls who um, either none of them or very few of them have any risk factors for heart disease, um, but they're very motivated to educate themselves and call their mothers and call their sisters and call their aunts and grandmothers and share the information and um, really make a difference. Um, with the Franklin and Marshall group, I um, a few years ago went and did some uh, work with them on just career counseling and talking about sort of what my job is like every day. And um, again, very engaged group and really thoughtful questions and um, really um, I'm just impressed at um, the, the quality um, and the level of, of the people that um, are just um, part of the chapters. Um, what it was interesting. I just, like I said, I just did the talk for uh, the Franklin and Marshall group, and I actually um, was very um, emotional. I got a sort of a lump in my throat because when you're sitting in a room full of women who are just starting out their careers, and mentorship is such a vitally important piece to all of our lives. And to see these women who have the opportunity, each and every one of them, to go out and really do something great with their lives, and um, no matter what career they choose, um, but to make a difference. And it, it's a very, um, it, it sort of felt like a very heavy um, burden to me to talk to them because um, you know, you're talking to a bunch of bright and engaged women who you want to help them sort of um, keep that spark going and, um, and never give up because they have an ability, again, like I said, no matter what the field or what they choose to do in their lives, whether they um, stay home and are stay-at-home moms or they go off and be present, um, that they can really make a difference in the world. And that, to me, was very um, meaningful. Um, I, you know, that's not what they were there to hear. They were here to, there to hear about heart disease. But we did talk a little bit about mentorship and life. And, um, and so it's, it's really been um, one of the most meaningful awards that I've received um, in my career um, because I think it really um, has um, um, not just you know, obviously, we had to meet criteria for the scientific piece of it and our plan and our and our thoughtfulness and, and our, our the business execution of the grant. Um, but they, but it, I got the feeling through the whole process, from the application to the interview process to 
um, the um, carrying out of giving us the grant and, and working with the foundation afterwards, that this is very important. Um, and they really want to be engaged. And, um, and they want to be part of it. So this is something we're doing together. It's not just a you know a foundation um, you know who provides X amount of money every year and they sort of send out checks, but that there's really truly an engagement, um, and that's really a different feel, and um, is really uh, for the the recipients um, should be a, uh, an obligation to um, continue to engage the group and um, really um, work to to help people make a difference. And so for me, uh, like I said, it's, it's been really a, quite a different feeling. And I've been, uh, um, uh, it's meant a whole lot more to me than many of the other things that have happened in my career. So again, I thank you. It's been a good experience. Wow. Well, we thank you. And I, I, feel, I feel like we're all so fortunate not only to have such talented members, but members who want to really help women going forward so that our future is so hopeful medically. It's wonderful. Megan, are we recording this so it's going to be shared? Yes, we are. So we are recording tonight's webinar so that we can share it. So um, we'll get the audio and visual from this as well. Um, and we will put that up on the website and we'll promote it through social media. Um, and so, you know, this conversation will be documented for other alpha fees to get in touch with. And um, Dr. Skelding, you can feel free to, to share it with whoever you would like to on your end as well. Um, I just, you know, want to wrap up this evening by just saying thank you for um, being on the webinar with us tonight and for all of the work that you do. Um, we're proud of you, obviously. Mm -hmm. That's why you're our 2015 Heart to Heart Grant recipient. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, it's been great partnering with Geisinger Health System. And we look forward to continuing to partner together. Um, and again, thank you just so much for tonight. And thank you for everybody who is on the call joining us this evening. Um, we hope you all have a wonderful evening and that we end Heart Health Month here in a good way. We only have a couple of days left. So um, happy Heart Health Month to all. All right, good night. Thank you, good night.